Welcome to the world of Frostpunk. In this setting, the world is mighty cold. Survivors flock to coal-powered generators and ring their settlements around them to survive, much like people gathering around a campfire. The player has two goals, to make a thriving city and to not be banished from it. If you're banished, then you see a guy who's supposed to be you, who you otherwise don't see, trudging off to die in the frozen wasteland. Banishment happens for two reasons, a lack of faith in you or a surplus of rage at you. The player basically has HP bars that represent this, hope and discontent. They must both be monitored and maintained, and that's pretty much the game. If hope gets to zero or discontent gets to 100, then the player's in danger. There's a single chance to make things right. Either happiness can be raised within a time limit, or a past law can be used, such as using guards to forcibly stop the mob. If this chance fails, then the citizens will banish you to die in the frozen wasteland. And by the way, you only get one chance to survive here. I made the mistake of thinking that I could still use the guards after asking for more time, but nope. Apparently the guards will only follow your orders if you don't try to bow to the people first. Things can go badly quickly because the two approval bars normally fluctuate. If the people are too cold, then discontent rises. If citizens die, then hope falls. If you make a promise but the timer runs out before you can deliver it, then they get angry. Various plot points also upset them. Because of this, many methods exist to raise their happiness. For example, if you choose the order policy tree, then you can build guard stations, have guards patrol to make the people feel safer, and that action lowers discontent. Similarly, having a cemetery lowers the amount of hope that's lost when people die. But despite the extreme importance of their constant approval rating, citizens don't matter as unique people. NPCs occasionally pop up some dialogue, and if you click on them, then the game will show you if they're alone in the world or if they have family. They don't have any character development, though. There are some brief events, but no plot lines, dialogue, or a sense of individualism, what you see is what you get. Plus, casualties among the citizenry are an expected part of the game. So, altogether, the story is basically that you're the leader of a bunch of hostile people who want to know you died slowly, alone, and in the cold, if you didn't keep them happy enough during a natural disaster. You just try to build a thriving city and keep them alive for 43 days, without them kicking you out to die first. And that's it. It's not exactly a pleasant situation to roleplay. Trying to keep them from banishing you before the game's end is really the core focus because the city itself is comparatively easy to manage. In Frostpunk, you're more worried about a frosty reception than you are the actual frost. The gameplay. Resources can be gathered, used, and stored in bulk. Where to build is straightforward since houses don't have heaters, other buildings do, and some buildings don't need heat. The player just needs to ring buildings outward as is appropriate. The people need to have enough homes, food, heat, and medical care. Where to build resource collection buildings and outpost team generators is also an easy choice because the points are preset. The workshop is a unique building though. Putting engineers into one allows for tech tree research. You can also speed up research by building multiple workshops. And as is usual with strategy games, more research leads to unlocking better versions of buildings and improvements for units. There's also a policy system, and the player gets two policy trees. One is adaptation. The second tree is a choice, orderly life or spiritual life. Whichever one's chosen gives benefits as well. However, many of the orderly or spiritual benefits come at a cost, and these costs get more extreme the deeper you go down the tree. What's chosen also affects the ending because you can go too far, which leads to surviving, but at what cost? In addition to this city management sim, there's also an exploration map. Exploring it yields many benefits. For instance, it's the only place where steam cores can be gained. These cores are used to construct several advanced buildings and the very useful automatons, which can run many different facilities without being affected by the cold. Only scouts and outpost teams can be sent out onto this map. Scouts can discover other dismal attempts at survival, rescue or abandon other survivors, and find supplies. Some of these supplies are at points that require outposts, and only the outpost teams can gather those. The teams construct outpost depots at the points, and then go back and forth between the post and the base automatically, making big, useful deliveries. Outposts are very useful due to just how much they yield. If a player continues to do normal resource harvesting and then adds in outpost deliveries, it's easy to quickly build stockpiles of resources. Warehouses do need to be constructed to stockpile beyond the starting limits, but since they require no heating and can be built repeatedly, they're simple to add in. Building a beacon allows for a single scout unit to be made. Additional research allows for a few more. 
there aren't a ton of spots to find, and so this number works well enough. But unfortunately, only two outpost teams can be made, and that's not enough to cover all of the different resource supply zones at once. The teams can dismantle an outpost and be sent to other locations, but each one can only gather one resource type at a time. These limitations feel odd in context. It's especially weird since a player can make as many flying hunters as they like, taking off in steampunk skyships. But delivery men go by foot and are a rare breed. Despite these limitations, juggling what to build, when, and having the resources to do it was still easy. It was also strange how simple it was, because while the people are fussy, the city itself is comparatively easy to manage. Destruction can only easily happen if the generators push too hard for too long. It can blow up, but the game gives you ample opportunity to stop this. Otherwise, since the city will continue on unless everyone dies, it'd be difficult to have the city actually fail. This means that banishment is the only huge game-ending threat for most of the game. At the end, there's a point where people could probably freeze to death before they could banish you. But even then, that'd be a difficult failure to achieve. They'd probably shiver outside to exile you first. So the main problem was just how fussy the citizenry was, and there were many points of fussiness with them. Some perceived fussiness was due to weird, mechanical limitations in the game, which made little sense. For instance, 10 people was the limit for living in a tent, and that was fine. But then that exact same number was also the limit for how many people could live in a two-story house. I mean, look at this thing. I think more than 10 people could fit in there in an emergency scenario. Plus, Frostpunk doesn't let you put heaters into houses, but it does let you put heaters into various workplaces. If you rescue many people, then their homes ring out beyond the inner ring, and the rings get increasingly colder as they go away from the core. As a result, workplaces were often warm due to the heaters, but houses could sometimes become chilly. In the real world, during severe weather, such as a hurricane, people shelter in community centers, schools, and other large buildings that can accommodate many people. Citizens insisting on only sheltering in unheated houses with 10 people to a house felt bizarrely finicky in context. When space is limited and people are in danger of freezing to death, then that behavior just doesn't make sense. I get that these restrictions only existed to make the game challenging, but I think that they harmed the grittiness of the setting and made the citizens seem weirdly picky. These sorts of challenging restrictions don't just stop at their housing either. For instance, the only way to get people to work at night is to force them to work for 24 hours straight. You can sign a new law to make that an option. However, there's no option for a night shift. No matter what, all citizens insist on having a strict sleep schedule and only being awake during the day. Even if you have hundreds of people, nobody's willing to work at night to help keep their home, the last bastion of humanity that they know of, going. It's also worth mentioning that citizens become angry or hopeless due to forced events in the plot too. The game's not just about managing their housing, work, warmth, and expectations. For example, a bunch of people become upset after a nearby fallen civilization is revealed. This is an unavoidable plot point. If you don't find the city on your own, then a random guy shows up, delivers the news that it fell, and dies. Several citizens react to this news poorly. They insist that London must be okay at least. It really must. Cue patriotic insanity. They lament that they trekked through the snow for nothing, built for nothing, and believe that they ought to keep on plowing through a frozen wasteland on a hope and a dream. Despite almost not making it to this tower to begin with and having children in tow, there's no sensible compromise option either, such as, say, sending out a volunteer scout team of these Londoners in full kit. They just want to go in a big group with kids and go soon. To fulfill their desire of leaving in as big a group as possible, these Londoners try to stir up discontent until they eventually leave with however many people they could convince to go with them. And by the way, some of the ways that they expressed their discontent was odd. I mean, who brought spray paint? We arrived here with very little. Someone packed that instead of supplies. Hmm. Huh. Well, that makes more sense. I thought that this arc felt forced and lame, because their plan wasn't really a plan, but a wild hope. Leaving a heat source and their new homes to trudge into a frozen wasteland because maybe, maybe, they'd find another city before they froze to death wasn't a convincing argument. You can even decide whether or not to equip them with anything because they're ready to walk off without proper supplies. Given all of this, persuasion should have been incredibly difficult for them, but instead, hope had to be rather high to stop it. Plus, these Londoners lost their patience and risked death 
rather quickly in game. It took 15 days for them to leave after the discovery, and hope had been high beforehand. This made the survivors seem even more ridiculous, because they were flipping out and could be convinced to leave in about two weeks' time over things like a house being too chilly sometimes. I mean, if they thought their house was chilly, how chilly would they think the trek would be? They've already made it, so they should know. Even if some people leave, though, it's not game over. In fact, there are plenty of survivors nearby who can become future citizens. I had some people leave, but still ended the game with 555 people, and I wasn't exactly trying to be the best leader I could be. I just wanted to finish the game as quickly as I could because I wasn't enjoying being the leader. But disappointingly, adding to the number of surviving citizens was unrewarding, and another flawed point in the game. Finding survivors is usually random and happens when scouts find points on the map. They'll spot a trail of smoke or something. It should have been an epic moment when people were found in these frozen wastes. And the descriptive journal entries were decent, but unfortunately, rescuing people didn't feel satisfying overall. A big problem was that the drama was cheapened by the map mechanics. A player couldn't come back later for survivors. If you found them, then you had to decide if they lived or died right away. But if you didn't find them, then they could survive for longer on their own. So if you noticed signs of life, then it seemed best to ignore them until you were definitely ready for more people. This was because discovered survivors immediately required housing, food, and medical care if injured or ill. Any time that they spent going without anything immediately affected the discontent and hope bars. Plus, remember, you can have more than one scout searching the map. So it's easy to find two groups of people at once, which leads to a large incoming amount of refugees. If resources can't accommodate a huge group at the moment, then discovering bunches of people at once and bringing them back to the base is bad for your approval rating. This penalty and the saved people immediately adding to an increased drive to oust the player felt irritating. I mean, they're ready to doom you to a fate you spared them from. It seems kind of... Yet, it was easy to avoid such moral dilemmas if I just ignored some life signs for a bit. And it wasn't harsh at all. They'd be fine until I was ready for all of them. This meant that there was no sense of risk or danger, which was very artificial in context. See that trailing wisp of smoke? Eh, leave it. That's people. They'll be fine. It's only if we go over there that they're suddenly dying. They'll be in a time stasis until then, like Sleeping Beauties. No problem. Meanwhile, other mechanics were bothersome from a busy work perspective. For example, occupying the buildings with workers was a hassle. There was no automatically fill with workers button. This meant that whenever someone got hospitalized, injured, or died, then I had to manually go click on each building to refill it to top worker capacity. This felt like busy work. I would have liked to have had an automated setting for unemployed workers to just filter in to open work slots. This sounds minor, but over the course of the game, about 10 hours, it felt ridiculous to keep dealing with. This sort of busy work was a common problem with other tasks too. For instance, workplaces have individual heaters if you've researched the tech. They can be set to auto turn on whenever workers are present. I had plenty of coal and didn't want any of my workers to get ill or get frostbite. It seemed as if I should have just been able to set the heaters collectively, but this isn't an option. Instead, a heater either has to be clicked on in its building or the heat has to be individually flicked on on the temperature overlay. Lastly, there's the ending. The ending made me dislike the game even more. Basically, it gets colder. The player needs to prep for that. And if you can survive the final burst of cold, then everything's fine. After the game tells you that you lived, then there's an epilogue which says what sort of society you made. If it was really religious, really tyrannical, or fine. That not only felt anticlimactic and simple, but it was also wonky in my playthrough. When the big storm hit, then I needed to make the rations go farther. I was concerned that there might not be enough food. There was a law to make soup. A law. I couldn't just temporarily thin the rations to get through an emergency situation, wherein even the food production plants were freezing. Signing the law meant that even though my citizens had hearty meals for the entire time prior and only ate soup briefly for a few days, there was a whining line in the epilogue about having to survive on nothing but soup. Plus, they claimed it was the first thing that they had to do. It was a few days. A few days at the end of the game. The look and the sound. 
Visually, it has a nice look to it. The automatons look especially neat, crawling and clanking around. There's more detail when you zoom in, too. The music is well done and sounds cinematic. Its orchestral scores blend well into the game and add to the atmosphere. It's got a nice classical, ambient kind of soundtrack. No songs get tiresome either, because the main plot's short and the soundtrack's about an hour and a half long. However, many of the songs do sound similar. There's not much of a sense of place between different zones, the passing of time or a sense of mounting tension. The ending tune does have an okay amount of tension, but other points, I don't know, I just didn't feel it. Final thoughts. The resource gathering side of things was a breeze. Research was easy and construction was simple. What was difficult was keeping the citizens from banishing me. I kept promising goals, but I often finished a little too short on time. I soon learned to take the quickest options. For instance, it was easier to promise to make a new medical post within a time limit than it was to heal everybody, because more people might get sick as I was trying to heal the current ones, and I could go slightly past the timer. A building was a safe guarantee. It could be slapped down fast, which meant that the choice had no risk at all, and I could just tear it down later if need be. Realizing stuff like that made it easy to overcome the main difficulty, the people. But overall, NPC approval being the main difficulty, instead of the Frost, made Frostpunk feel more like a whiny citizen management game rather than a game about surviving against the odds in a harsh, wintry climate. It was also very short, which underlined how ridiculous the NPCs were being. Settlement to finish line only lasted for 43 days in-game. I think that the challenge should have been the environment, not the NPC's hostile reactions to it or the player. Or at least, these NPCs should have been made more interesting and less moronic if their discontent and hope levels were to be the true focus and challenge. Cardboard cutouts of people with seemingly fussy, moronic behavior threatening me with banishment if I didn't make them cozy enough within a month felt lame. Meanwhile, mechanical problems made the gameplay worse. A simple ending and an unrewarding epilogue on top of that was just disappointing. I'd hoped that the ending would redeem it, but then I just sat and waited for a storm to pass, which left me with a very meh impression of the game. It looking good and sounding good wasn't enough to overcome all of that. I also have a small note to add. The game crashed when I didn't allow it through my firewall. 11-Bit Studios claims in its privacy policy that it doesn't use data for marketing, but based on what's written in it, it seems like they do use data to push DLC. I'm not quite sure, but that's what I got out of it. I checked Frostpunk's settings and there was no analytics button or anything to uncheck, no indication of what the callouts were for either. I think that's worth a quick mention. I tried to find out more online, but all I found were posts from others saying things like, if the game doesn't work, then turn off your firewall. Oh, the weather outside is frightful, but the fire is so delightful. Generator, please don't blow. It'll snow, it'll snow, it'll snow.